Welcome to Rat Lab Religion, Arts and Technology. I'm your co-host, Sharaf Gantarin. Today's objective is to go through a short document that I have created. Um, it's based on a book on how to write well. And for some odd reason, I'm forgetting the title of that book. I don't think it was style, but it, it, its title was something like stylish or style something as if uh, something similar to that. But uh, no, nevertheless, although I do not recall where I received uh, this, uh, this, this guideline, I still remember uh, sitting in a class uh, on communications, political communications, taught by an uh, old uh, professor of mine, a colleague of mine now, uh, Dr. Adrian uh, uh, Christensen. And uh, it was taught as a during my undergraduate coursework. Um, and I took it, I think I was a senior, maybe senior fall. Yeah, I think fall semester, senior year. Um, or maybe spring semester, but definitely by the end of my undergraduate coursework. Nevertheless, I just, uh, she gave a lecture on these steps. Maybe I just took it from her and I was just taking notes in the classroom and it wasn't from a book. But uh, what I do recall is that it was uh, really uh, an important classroom moment for me uh, because it, what it did was, that was so, uh, that I appreciated so much is that it broke down writing into a series of steps which therefore allows writing to become demystified and made into a process that can be emulated and mastered at science, you know, is a politically charged category. Um, it makes claims to universality, but nevertheless, one of the basic points about science is that it can be broken down into discrete steps and you can repeat those steps. So for someone like me, who kind of grew up in a, in a, in a, in a moment in a city where reading literature really was not the thing, I don't think I ever read a novel until ninth grade, uh, Romeo and Juliet by Mr. Phil Kraut. Uh, God bless that man. But, uh, or maybe it was Hamlet. I think it was Hamlet and then, no, it was the Odyssey. The Odyssey and then Romeo and Juliet. Those were the first ever um, literature that I read and it was at the age of 13. So for me, writing, reading was something that came about much later. And uh, it was just a really great lecture on um, helping demystify the process of writing because one of the fears or consternations one has when it comes to writing is that writing somehow just mystic mystically just comes to you out of nowhere and then you start to write. Uh, sometimes that can happen. Um, sometimes just words come and sentences come and, and you write very well. But most of the time uh, you do feel a little frustrated, but this is the way in which you can overcome your frustration and kind of gain a sense of command over how to write. Uh, you're never going to be writing perfectly, just like sports. Writing is a skill that requires repetition, and you never really fully master it. The whole joy is to just keep learning how to write and just enjoy the process of writing. Just like with sports, you're not going to win every single match, but you got to enjoy the matches you play. Um, but nevertheless, with the scientific kind of like method in place, you can always overcome and get over your paranoias or you're just sense of feeling vague or feeling a little lost and not knowing how to fix a sentence or not knowing how good of writing you have done you can always um, give yourself feedback edit your own work rewrite and enjoy the process of rewriting because you know why you're rewriting what you're rewriting um, it, it it becomes for as an engineer you know you're making and make building your blocks and you break it down and you build it again and you know why you're doing what you're doing so this is a document I assign to my students as well. Um, and I just think it could be useful for some of you who have writing intensive courses and do uh, stress on writing a lot. Um, you're teaching courses that fulfill writing requirements. Um, you have them write big essays, even four page long essays. I have them write weekly reflection papers and I demand that they uh, limit the number of sentences to 10 uh, because I expect a large, well-developed paragraph to consist of 10 sentences uh, somewhere thereabouts but having them write 10 sentences i'm really asking them to write me a paragraph one solid paragraph and what does a paragraph do it introduces a theme a topic and then it defends or describes develops that topic that's essentially what a paragraph is uh, so to think of it like in music you know a measure has a certain number of notes um, likewise, a paragraph has certain number of sentences. All of the sentences collectively convey 
one topic. And so I want the students to kind of gain the discipline of how to write a paragraph, how to make one point over the course of 10 sentences. Um, seems like a very small, minor project, but when it comes down to this challenge of limiting your topic, identifying what the topic is, and seeing how well each sentence explicates or defends or develops that topic over the course of 10 sentences, becomes a kind of a strategic, uh, um, a kind of a challenge. Um, and you have to come up with strategies. You've got to pick your sentences uh, wisely. You've got to pick your words wisely. You've got to be concise, um, etc. So how do you go about doing all of that? How do you write that very good sent paragraph? Um, this is a, a document I created uh, from uh, based on the things I had heard Professor Christensen uh, from her lecture way back when I was an undergraduate student. Uh, and it comes very handy when I... Uh, just attach this document to, for, for my students. And uh, since we don't do face-to-face -face classes anymore, we're just going to have my students as well uh, listen in, tune in uh, to this uh, video. So there's a method that you can go by to go through each sentence and see what are the problems with your sentence. So it's kind of a diagnostics toolkit. A toolkit like for a doctor, what do you need to do in your surgery to fix your sentence? First of all, what you want to do is you want to circle the prepositions. Prepositions are words uh, that we often clutch to uh, and rely heavily upon when we are just not so sure about what we're trying to say. They do a good job like a kind of like mayonnaise or ketchup. The more you add, it just feels like you're doing a good enough job with your sandwich. They just add more words. And uh, with more words, you just feel more comfortable that you wrote something. But oftentimes, prepositions manifest a problem. Uh, they reveal that the sentence needs a lot of fixing. Every now and then, you will have sentences with prepositions. Um, the diet here doesn't mean uh, no preposition at any moment, but it does mean as little preposition as possible. Most sentences should not have prepositions. And if there are too many prepositions, that is definitely a sign that the sentence needs fixing and it could be edited and made better. Secondly, you want to underline the is forms. The is forms means the to be uh, form. So like when you are using is uh, and you do not have an active verb, uh, oftentimes you have a lot of is uh, in your sentences. Figure out where is the action, who is kicking who, put the kicking action in an active verb. Now, this is what the is form oftentimes does. It oftentimes conceals an active verb. Um, and so when you get rid of the is form, you're really challenging yourself to figure out where is the action happening in your sentence. Identify that and then put an active verb in there because the active verb usually is concealed and is disappeared because of your sentence's problems. So you always want active verbs in your sentences. Start fast, get ready. Get rid of silly soy sauce phrases that add no meat to your sentence. So basically, oftentimes we put words and phrases that just aren't doing anything for our sentence. We got to be very strategic. We got to use our words very uh, strategically. And we just got to cut any phrase that is just not doing anything for our work. Every word, every sentence has a role in this theater, in this drama. This is something I want the students to get through, that when you write, you want to be very careful and you want to be very reflective when you read your writing. Am I putting words that I need to? Are there any words that are doing no good job, that are just sitting there dangling there for no reason? If there are, those words need to be taken out. Okay, exercise. I have some sentences and I won't go through all of them because the rest of them actually don't remember what the right edition, edited versions of these sentences were. Uh, but this one I do recall. And it's actually just a very basic, easy example of how to fix a sentence. Uh, the reason I like this sentence is actually because it reads actually a pretty good sentence. There's no some serious problems with this sentence. Um, it reads very well. It's smooth. It reads really easily. But even here, you can find examples of um, excessive words. You can limit and you can shorten your writing. So the sentence, a sta a sentence goes, physical satisfaction is the most obvious of the consequences of premarital sex. So first, as I said, you circle the prepositions. Those prepositions would be off. The word off appears twice. So you want the off to be 
highlighted and let's just do that for the case sake here those are my prepositions okay um, secondly it said look for the is 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 hiding the active verb so what I will do is I find my is let's use blue and here is my is oops okay so I found the off those are my prepositions and I found is form and okay now the question is who is kicking who you got to identify where is the active verb what is the verb here consequence is that the verb obvious is that it where is the verb for that I may need to know what is the noun what is doing the verb what is the doing the action right uh, where is the noun oftentimes the noun usually is as at the beginning of a sentence in this particular case however it is at the end of the sentence so I'll identify my noun I'll underline that and then I will look for my verb if sex is the noun what is the sentence suggesting about sex what is sex doing what is the, the thing that sex does here it satisfies right satisfies so we're gonna turn this into satisfies that's the active verb hiding because of the is form that is your active verb satisfies it was hiding because once you said physical satisfaction you had to follow that with is so you find the is and since is was hiding the active verb no wonder the active verb was basically hiding in this phrase in this ion phrase it satisfies so having said all that what do we get out of this what is the revised sentence look like it is the shortest sentence you can think about sex satisfies two words a two-word sentence even premarital um, sex if the topic is about the distinction between premarital and postmarital sex then perhaps you would use the word premarital sex but if the topic is about sex and premarital is just an addition there you may not even need that word so be very judicious of what words do you really need if sex is your topic and the premarital postmarital distinction is something you're not interested in you don't need the word premarital then you just say sex becomes your noun a premarital you just get rid of it and satisfies your active verb and that's the end of the sentence sex satisfies so i reduce one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve twelve words I reduce that to two words okay the difference of 10 words that's plenty there's a lot of words in one sentence a good decent sentence I was still able to churn out 10 words out of that and make it shorter so you can do other exercises like that which I have here uh, other sentences that students can go through um, second thing I have the students talk about and this is very minor but sometimes uh, we we use passive verbs in our sentences so in this particular case uh, I'll just read this paragraph for you some astonishing questions about the nature of the universe have been raised by scientists exploring black holes in space that's the first sentence of this paragraph the second sentence is a black hole is created by the collapse of a dead star into a point perhaps no larger than a marble is created by is a passive phrase because the active phrase as this paragraph the ex exact same paragraph but with this minor active uh, replacing happens the active would be creates right so this is one of the insights that differs from the insight in our step-to-step -step list right in our step-to-step -step, we said you want to underline the is and then find the active verb in this particular context you actually do not want to do that you want to abide by the is created by you want to stick with your passive verb is created by as opposed to marble creates and the reason for that is just very simple because your first sentence ends with the with the topic of black holes and that is your topic of the paragraph this paragraph is about black holes rather than about 
questions or um, or uh, scientists, uh, you want the and since the the word black hole is the last bit said in the first sentence, you want the word black hole to be the beginning part of the second sentence because it just it it reads smoothly. The reader knows black hole is the is the topic of this of the paragraph. In this context, black hole appears at the end of both the first and the second sentence, so it's just not appearing close to each other. It's being too staggered out and therefore making it harder for the reader to know that this topic is about black hole. So point here is, it's a very minor grammatical point, but it's a much more uh, important uh, principal point, which is that since you know that your paragraph is supposed to have one theme, the best way to make your theme speak out and make its presence felt for the reader is to ensure that your themes are not staggered far away. So if, you, if your theme appears at the end of the sentences, one sentence after the other, it's too staggered out. Instead, your theme, if it does appear at the end of the first sentence, it makes a lot of sense for the theme to reappear at the beginning of the second sentence. Okay. Third is the difference between coherence and cohesion. You want both coherence and cohesion in your writing. That is your goal for writing. Good writing has both coherence and cohesion. However, cohesion is really critical for your writing because cohesion is the measure of how well you are able to identify and convey the topic of your writing. What is this about? What are you writing about? That is a measure of cohesion. A cohesive writing will have one topic. A, a uncohesive writing may have really wonderful sentences without any problem, flawless sentences, no prepositions, active verbs, all good, but you just cannot figure out what the cohesiveness is. You cannot figure out what is this topic about. So it reads coherently, but it is not cohesive. Um, so here's an example of a very of a set of really good sentences, but you just do not know what this paragraph collectively is about. Say in a Wisconsin is the snowmobile capital of the world. Good sentence. The buzzing of snowmobile engines fills the air and their tank-like tracks crisscross the snow. Decent sentence still. For now, we think snowmobile is the topic of this paragraph because snowmobile shows up at the second half of the first sentence. Snowmobile is the beginning of the second sentence. So we think snowmobile is the topic of this paragraph, but here things start to unravel. The snow reminds me of my mom's mashed potatoes covered with furrows I would draw with my fork. Now all of a sudden we're talking about mom and her mashed potatoes which you would draw with your fork. Where are we going now? That is a reader's first instinct when you read it, right? What is it about? Wait a second, I thought we were talking about snowmobiles. So it's really key to make sure now this gets a little like ridiculous. Mom's mashed potatoes usually made me sick and so I used to play and then it just gets, it exaggerates the lack of a topic here. But oftentimes when you're going to do be writing and your students are going to be writing, um, you will find that there are a bunch of good sentences but because they're not sure what they're really talking about, you're going to have sentences that seem good individually but you don't know what it is about. You have to figure out what it is about. That is what this assignment is about. A paragraph must have one topic, and that topic must be easy for the reader to observe and detect while reading that paragraph. If you do so, you're in good shape. In that context, even a couple of prepositions here and there, the reader will forgive you because the reader wants to know what are you writing about. If they cannot figure that out, you can have 10 great sentences, but where what's, it's like 10 great dancers, but they're all doing dancing to their own beat. Uh, individually, they may all look good, but collectively, um, it won't look good for the audience, right? So you need to know what your beat is. You need to know what is this paragraph about. Just like with music, you got to have the harmony. you got to have the beat. you got to have the bass. you got to make sure that the person knows what they are listening to as opposed to a cacophony, right? Uh, okay, lastly, subjects are not necessarily the topic of a paragraph. So you'll have various subjects in your sentences. And this is the key part about making diversity in your writing. Because if you are writing a paragraph that has just one topic, that doesn't mean that all your sentences will be the same. Because, of course, that sounds ridiculous. Your sentences should be different. Otherwise, you're just repeating. You don't want to just repeat anything because that's uh, 
unnecessary. You want to reduce the word count. So repetition is not what we're looking for, but we're looking for consistency and focus. So how do we do that? Well, we do that by making sure that our sentences have a wide range of subjects, but nevertheless, those wide range of subjects all convey one topic. Okay, so like a family, you got different kids, some boys, some girls, etc. But there is one family. Similarly, this is a family with various subjects, but one topic. And there are some examples of that. And then this is where I think this paragraph is just really beautifully done. So this is the paragraph which summarizes all the main principles in this document on how to write a paragraph. So kind of like a double, you know point here like it's magic basically you read something which is telling you how to write uh, a par you read a paragraph that is telling you how to write a paragraph um, and one a one b is the paragraph that uh that does the job here so i'll just go to one b right away and read it out loud for you in this paragraph i in this paragraph i have bold-faced topics Topics are crucial for a reader because they focus attention on particular ideas toward the beginning of sentences and thereby notify readers what a whole passage is about. So the topic of this paragraph is topics. I hope you understood that, right? I'll repeat. The topic of this paragraph is topics, which is why the word topics is in bold. They is referencing to topics. So there's a certain... Uh, focus without repetition, you can see there, right? And I is the subject of this sentence, but not necessarily the topic of the paragraph, right? Topic is topics. What is a topic? Well, this is what it is. It notifies the reader what this passage is about. If a sequence of topics seem coherent, then readers will feel they're moving through a paragraph from a cumulatively coherent point of view. So still, you can see we have a new subject here sequence of topics but we still have the same topic which is topics but if through that paragraph topics shift randomly then the reader has to begin each sentence out of context from no coherent point of view so one of the ways in which you diversify your set of sentences in this particular example you can see the ways that contrast is a really helpful tool for you so if you're able to make contrast and say if you do this then this happens but if you do this then that will happen there you have two different sentences, but both have the same topic, right? If you do this, this will happen. If you do that, that will happen. It is contrasting you uh, what happens in the, what is at stake in having a topic. That's the, that's the topic of these two sentences, right? It's further delineating this topic of topic and telling you uh, what happens, what is at stake. Well, if you have a good topic, you know, readers will move through. If you do not have, the reader will feel lost. This is what is at stake here. When that happens, the reader will feel dislocated, disoriented, out of focus. So here the subject is the reader, but we still know that the topic is topics because they're telling you the effect of not having a topic on the reader. So I just thought it was a brilliant little par paragraph and it is a paragraph. It is a complete paragraph with uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, six sentences perhaps. That is enough. That is enough for a good paragraph. Um, Sometimes you, you can do it within six sentences. Sometimes you can do it within five sentences. But for my students, I have them write 10 sentences, a nice, well-developed paragraph for that. Um, and uh, it just is a good exercise. I don't really go crazy about grading them. I give them a complete for doing it and incomplete for not doing it. So if you just do it, you get full points because I don't want the students to be too worried about the grades I'm giving them and instead just enjoy the process of writing. Uh, and let that great stuff not factor into any of your anxieties. And eventually, this just also serves as a good note uh, for your finals and your midterm. And just, you know, just you can keep it with you and just remember what you learned in the class. Uh, just a great way to add to your reading habit. When you're reading something, if you can write a paragraph, what you read is about, that means you have now an evidence that you did your reading and you can always refer to this paragraph you wrote and read it out loud to remind what you had re read before. So it's a great habit to add as well. I hope you enjoyed this and I hope if uh, this is useful for you, uh, you can uh, add to your courses as well. Have a good one. Goodbye.